Greetings. I am so happy y'all are getting in. Um, we're going to give it a couple minutes while people are getting on, but what I'd like to do is I got a couple questions. We are going to be talking about credit cards today. So if you'd throw it in the chat, I would love to know what you like to go shopping for. Are you a person who likes to shop for shoes, handbags, clothes, um, or something else? So throw what your favorite thing is to go shopping for. And let's kind of see what everyone's uh, favors are. Baby stuff, nice, nice. I love that one myself. I'll tell you one of my favorite things to go shopping for are um, things for the house. Uh, I am that person who loves to get the little knickknacks. I don't like to have a lot of knickknacks to dust around, but I like to have some of the knickknacks that are cool things like to have around the house. So throw in the chat what your favorite thing is to shop for. Uh, kitchen gear. Oh, that's fun stuff too. I love the kitchen section. Okay, let's see, let me check here. It seems like someone told me that they're having trouble typing in what they want to type. So let's see, we've got a technical issue. So I'm gonna allow you You know what, let's, let's do, um, there we go. It's typing in actually the question and answer. There we go. Um, so go to the question and answer. I'm sorry, not the chat, my error there. And type what your favorite thing is to shop for. Oh, things for your pets. That is a great one. That is a great one. House gadgets, house items. Now, household items, Tara, is that, um, would that be things like um, to decorate the house or household items like just stock up shop type of thing? Both. Okay. Okay. You're probably from the same school as I am. I grew up, um, you always stock up shop, so you didn't wait till last minute and be out of things. Shelly, household gadgets. What's your favorite type of gadget to shop for? And Brianna, I got to ask, what type of pet do you have? Oh, Shall I said kitchen tools? Nice, very nice. Excellent. An English bulldog. Oh, Brandon, he's gonna be adorable. We have, um, in my day, they used to be called mutts. Now he's got a, a fancy name. He is a um, Morky, a Maltese and Yorkie mix. Absolutely spoiled, absolutely spoiled. Okay, so really, that's a lot of responsible shopping. And I ask that because a lot of these purchases that we make are probably put on our charge card. And when we start looking at what we're going to look at today, um, this will all start clicking and making a little more sense with how to utilize that credit card to your advantage instead of letting it disadvantage you. So 
Let me, for those of you who are new to our call, my name is Kelly Bulkowski, and the reason I am putting this together is my hope is that when you leave today, you're going to have um, a really good understanding of how your card works, what its strengths and advantages are, how to utilize the reward system that's on your card, um, how to evaluate the different cards so that you make the, the wisest purchase or the wisest usage of your credit card to benefit you. Okay. So with that being said, let me tell you a little bit about who I am. So it all makes a little more sense on why I'm bringing this to you. I um, found out that I had superpowers. I know you're probably thinking Kelly superpowers, really? But I am here to tell you, ladies, that we all have them. We've been lied to for years. They are not the leaping tall buildings and flying from location to location, even though as moms and, and women, we do fly. I mean, let's face it, we're, we're always in a rush trying to get from one place to the other. But I've recognized these powers and evolved them over the years through the different chapters of my life. And there was a big chapter that involved credit cards. And I just felt that this would be an amazing chapter to kind of share and share what I've learned with that so that hopefully some of the mistakes that I made, you guys won't make. And some of the strengths that I've built and evolved, you'll be able to utilize as well. Um, to give you a little clear picture, I am talking about around 1997, my kids were about one and three years old, and I fully realized the swirl that the financial swirl that my family was in. You see, if my husband had one dollar in his pocket, he'd spend two, my then husband. Um, my job was to find a way to make everything work and to make uh, bills get paid, food on the table, and, and move forward. So at one point in time, I had 14 different credit cards that I would bounce balances for and I would spend with in order to keep ahead of everything. I would sit down every Saturday morning at my kitchen table and lay out all these statements for all these cards and all the bills and figure out what could I pay with a credit card and which credit card could I pay with a credit card so that I stayed ahead of our balances and not end up with a situation where um, I had a late payment. I um, also developed a talent for discerning which cards could give me the longest time with their balance transfers. Uh, if I did a balance transfer from this credit to this credit card, how long would that procrastinate another payment being due? This time in my life, I felt very discouraged, defeated, um, to deal with the overwhelm and frustration that I felt in my life at that time, I would uh, a lot of times take a walk and try to clear my head and just try to emotionally kind of deal with everything that was going on and, and get some, some peace. Um, on, and this way too, if I did it on my walk, then the kids never saw mommy upset. Mommy could be mommy when she, mommy was home. Um, one walk, I remember, I was feeling particularly overwhelmed with the feeling of almost drowning. I was drowning and gasping for air with every month to try and stay ahead of the pole that was pulling me under. And my spirit was broke. My heart and mind were exhausted from fighting against the current that was constantly um, swimming against, I guess is the best way to say it. And as I was taking my walk, I remember looking down and I was crossing the railroad tracks and I saw a $20 bill on the railroad tracks as I was crossing it. And it was nestled down between a rock and the rail, almost as if someone had placed it there so that it would be secure and had no way that it could blow away, but was definitely visible that you could see it was a $20 bill. At that moment, I started sobbing because I was so excited to, that I just found a $20 bill and I desperately needed that for groceries that week. And at that moment, everything in me sort of changed. Looking back, it's amazing the relief $20 could make in my life. But it was also 
extremely saddening. And it broke me that $20 could mean the difference between buying groceries for my family and not buying groceries. That $20 could have destroyed my, my week, but it, it saved my week. It was a blessing to find that money. And it made me determine right there that something had to change. And I had to start taking control instead of just going with the current and trying to stay afloat. I needed to start making a difference to actually take control of my spending and of our budget so that we would end this cycle. And that's when I started developing my superpower. Um, through determination, desire to give my kids a better life and to move my life in a better direction, I began saving money with um, different different ways um, instead of just a bank account, tax-free growth, um, positive compounding of interest. I learned what these things meant and started using them for myself and for my finances. Finally, my, my most important superpower was discernment. And probably the most useful power was the development of working knowledge of math and how understanding all this math could help me make that $20 devastation moment never be a possibility again. I entered the financial industry with the goal not just to keep not just to help women with their finances, but to empower them to become the best version of themselves, the golden version. Because when we decide that we're tired of surviving financially and interested in, and want to thrive, everything changes. I've lived it and I've done the work and I'm able to teach other women an unspoken financial secrets that will hopefully advance them and help them. And I believe that when you learn the secrets for yourself, it empowers you to become your own superhero for your future. So with that being said, I'd like to kind of enter into what we've got going on today. And let me pull up our, I'd like to share my screen. Hold on one second here. Okay, there we go. And we are going to share. Excellent. And can someone just shoot me a little message and let me know if you can see that okay? Fantastic. Okay, fantastic. So, um, taking control of our debt and our, with our credit cards. Most people think of credit cards as a necessity, but also kind of an evil when they start looking at the compounding interest. But we're gonna look at how we can actually turn credit cards to a strength for us with a little bit of knowledge and with a little bit of homework. So let's start with a little bit of credit card history. Um, if you look, about 1950 was when credit cards actually started being used. Frank Mc, let me think what his name was. Frank McNamara was the first person who started credit cards, and the reason he did it was because Frank was out to dinner with his buddies, and he was in New York at a dining dining at a restaurant, and Frank realized he forgot his wallet. Now this was 1950, so you can imagine the, the embarrassment and the, the um, kind of slap in the face when he had to call his wife to rescue him. He had to have his wife come down to the restaurant and pay his bill for him. He vowed that he would never be in that situation again, so he started the Diners Club charge card. And how that worked was the charge card could be used at different restaurants. And at the end of every month, you would get sent a bill and it would be for all the charges that you had incurred plus a five to 7% processing fee. And then you'd pay your bill and start over next month. Well, and that was great until 1958 when American Express wanted to kind of 
kick it up a notch, and they actually became the travel entertainment card. And they were not just at restaurants now, they had other options that you could actually use your charge card app. Bank of America, though, decided we're going to kick it up an extra notch. And this is the, the game changer, and this is kind of what we're most used to. And the way this works is um, they had a $300 revolving credit. So every month you could spend up to $300 and then start over the next month when you paid it off. And I say when you paid it off, because remember the mindset back in 1958 was you did not carry a balance. You, you paid these things off for the most part. Now, does that mean there wasn't a, a credit um, interest charged? Oh no, of course there was, but it's not the same mindset as today carrying a balance and having being in debt is not as big of a stigma as it, as it would have been when, when the cards originally started out. Now that's great, well and good, sounds fantastic. But now you notice I've left one thing out. It wasn't until 1974, that's right, 1974 was the first year that a woman, a single woman was allowed to have a charge card in her own name. Before that, a wife could use her husband's card. Her name might even be on there as Mrs. So-and-so, but a single woman was not allowed to have a charge card until 1974 with the opportunity that um, made the equal Equal Credit Opportunity Act um, blows our mind when you know when you've had it all your life. But when if you look back, that that was really something that was amazing that women had to to kind of fight for. Um, today, about seventy eight percent of women have a charge card, at least one, and use them frequently. Okay, so there are about six different types of credit cards. Standard unsecured credit card is, is the typical card. That's what most of us are used to. It has a revolving line of credit and that credit score or credit amount is established when you put in your application for the credit card and you can spend up to that maximum amount. And if you don't pay the card off every month, you get charged the interest on that card and interest on cards are normally 19%, 20% or higher. Um, limits can be increased. In fact, I just got a letter for one of my credit cards. They just upped my limit. So they're saying, hey, we'll allow you to have more credit with your card. And that's going to come in later. We're going to talk about that a few slides down. So I wanted to just mention that sometimes you will get notifications where they've raised your credit limit. Always make a mental note of that. And you'll see why when we get further into the slides. But knowing what your total credit amount is, is really important. Um, kind of a cute story about credit cards. I grew up again in, in, with parents who were paid their bills, didn't never had credit or never had bad credit, never put anything on credit. They always paid everything up front. Um, my dad was a firm believer in you just write a check or you go to the bank and you get a loan based on your word, based on your name. That's, that's how that worked back then. Until in the 1980s, late 80s, they went away on a trip and they were out of state. The car broke down. And when my dad went to write a check for the repairs, they would not accept his check. Now, this is a proud man who had always paid everything up right. Um, they made a call to the bank. The bank verified there were funds there, but they still had to stay in that town for two days extra to wait for the check to clear. He came back and actually did get a credit card, but up until that point um, had never used them. So just kind of a different thought process. Secured cards. Secured cards are there. The limit on those are determined by a collateral or a deposit that the client makes saying, I will give you this amount, example, $300, and know that I can spend up to that amount and I'll pay you back. So that deposit can, can be raised if they, they apply additional monies to it, but it, it caps off what the spending amount can be. People who have a secured credit card are probably someone who's had um, some poor credit issues and are struggling trying to rebuild that credit. That might be an option for them until they can get credit built back up to where they might again apply for a standard unsecured card. Student credit cards are a blessing and a curse. 
students are getting started, they need to start having some type of credit and they have had none. So um, when credit cards determine if they're a good risk, they're gonna look at, you know, could they, with whatever part-time job that they have while they're going to school, would they be able to pay back an estimated payment of about $10? Which that sounds fantastic. It sounds like it's a great tool. But here is the danger. Here is the, the cliff that happens so many times. Students are not taught about compounding interest. They see the credit card as, wow, now I can pay for my books, pay for my lab fees, pay for food. There's a thought, right? Um, buy supplies that they need for school or, well, other things. I know, mom, dad, we don't want to hear that one, but it happens, right? Um, and they run into the danger of getting in over their head because they don't understand how compound interest works. They think, okay, I'm going to put $300 for my books on my credit card, and then I'll pay it back later. Well, minimum payments, $10. Fantastic. I can afford $10, but they don't understand that that $300 is compounding interest. And now when they get it finally paid off, it's going to be years down the road if they make those minimum payments. And unfortunately, maybe they don't just have the one credit card because everyone wants to give them credit. So maybe they've got four or five of these cards where they've put the 300 on this card and maybe 500 on this card um, and maybe you know $100 on this card. And now all of a sudden, those $10 payments are, have strapped them. They, they can't get above paying just the minimum on these cards. So that's where that can kick in. I actually had a client who had come to me with exceptional credit card debt. They had found themselves underwater. They had graduate college and on top of student loans, they had all these credit cards and, and the compounding interest. So what we did was we took a step back, we evaluated their credit cards, determined which cards were best for them, which some are better than others, and developed a plan to pay off the credit cards and to start using the compounding interest to their benefit instead of crippling them. And we also used, picked which card was smart for them to use because they could get rewards with it that would actually help them as well. Small business credit cards, um, that's pretty straightforward. When, when a person starts their small business, that's basically a new entity. So they have to build credit for that business just like they would a separate person. So they can use credit cards purchases to do that. Store cards or co-branded cards. Um, examples of store cards that I think everyone would be familiar with would be like your Lowe's card, your Kohl's, um, Beals, Macy's, depending on where you're at in the country. Um, these are all cards where when you use them in that store, you may get a perk or a benefit. Maybe it's points, maybe it's cash back, but you get, you get that in, for using it in their store. Then there are store cards or co-branded that are, are where they can be used anywhere. Um, those would be like your Costco or your Sam's card. And when we use those cards, not only do we get special perks for shopping in those stores, but now we get special perks when we use them anywhere. Uh, a lot of times, um, maybe you get a certain level of cash back, like, like Costco, I believe is a 4% cash back when you shop in store with their credit card. Sam's um, is a 5%. We use it in store, you get a 5% back, cash back. So, but if you shop, let's say you take your, your Costco or your Sam's card and you go to um, Publix and you shop there for groceries, you're gonna get a percent back on groceries but not as high as what you would if you used it in that, in that store. Charge cards. Charge cards are the traditional, like that diner's club where you pay it off at the end of the month. There are still some traditional charge cards that when the bill comes, it must be paid off at the end of every month. No balance can be carried forward. Okay, now when we start looking at um, the whys, would you really want an annual fee? Well, sometimes we have no option. We have to use the, the 
carve the fee. If we've had life has happened and we maybe have had some things happen that have destroyed our credit or made it really poor, we may have to start with a card that has an annual fee. Pay the annual fee, use it for a while, start building up our credit to then maybe we would actually be eligible for that um, credit card that doesn't have a fee. So if you look back at that, that graph that we talked about before, it's still an unsecured card, but it has an annual fee to it. So it's just different steps that you go through. So um, once you've built the credit up, now you can get that unsecured card with no annual fee. But now not all cards with fees are necessarily bad because some cards that have a fee actually have benefits that are elevated. So for instance, maybe they have an upgraded status with hotels. You check in and because you have this specific card, you get an upgraded room or rental car, you get an upgraded car um, or maybe a lower rate on either of those. Or uh, one that's really nice for people who travel is maybe they get um, benefits like in the airport, instead of having to hang out in the terminal, they can actually go to an airport lounge where it's a little more comfortable. Maybe they get some free drink or food or that type of thing. So knowing what your card offers, again, huge, huge to determining which is the best card for you to use. And now we're gonna actually talk about those rewards in a little more detail. So when we talk about cash back, that just simply means like we were talking about before, there's normally a tiered um, system. And when you look at the card, they'll send you the breakdown on if I use this card here, I get 5%. If I use it here, 4%, 3%, 1%. But those categories are normally um, in store use or in specific type of store use. Then maybe it's uh, restaurant and travel. Then maybe it's gasoline. Um, maybe uh, what's another big one? Um, gasoline. Gasoline's a huge one right now. But then all other purchases, you get a flat rate. So you get a cash back level or, or amount back at each at for each type of purchase. But it may be better with certain cards than other cards. So it's always good to break those down and see where are my spending habits and what percentage back can I get with this credit card? And then do it for each one of your cards and see which one has the most cash back option for you. Um, travel rewards run a little bit different. Instead of um, cash back, which a lot of them you can still opt for cash back, but you can actually put it towards mileage or um, travel time or, or hotel reservations or those types of things, which are great. The only thing I say with travel is make sure you understand if they have any type of um, blackout dates or limitations on times of travel. Um, not fun to plan your trip and then find out it's in that blackout period where you can't, can't utilize it. And then points earned. Now that's an interesting one because we still see that today. And with these points, often what happens is you can use those points for vouchers or gift cards or that type of thing. And I had a friend of mine who would follow this stuff so closely. And what she would do is there was a certain gas station that used to, they, they did the points reward system and they would every once in a while offer where you could buy a gift card for $50 or $40, you pay $40 for it, but it was a $50 gas card. So they're trying to promote people to buy their gift cards. So she would buy the $50 gift card for $40, but she didn't give it to anyone. She used it. And because she was purchasing it with her rewards card, she was also getting the points for that purchase. So she would get the points for the $50 purchase, plus she would get the free $10 extra in gas. And then she would not just buy one of these cards, she'd buy multiple of them. So by the time she was done, she'd have all these cards for her gas, but she'd also have these points where she could maybe use it for another gift card for something else. That's a lot of homework, but hey, if you're if you um, are dedicated, it's a, it's definitely a, a way to make that work. And gas was something she knew she was going to use, so it wasn't going to go to waste. OK, 
Okay. All right. And so balance transfers, I, now I'm not sure if anyone is throwing stuff in the questions. I'll be real honest, unless I pull it up right here, it's gonna pull right up on my screen. Let me take a look real quick. Did we have any questions so far? Nope, we're doing good. Excellent. Okay. And I'll try and answer everybody's questions at the end. Um, just if there's something that you have that is or would benefit to actually talk about it right now, feel free to throw it up there and, and I'll make sure we take a look at it. Um, balance transfers, most of you who have gotten a credit card have probably gotten the checks in the mail where they say you can go ahead and transfer this balance from a past credit card or an existing credit card to this credit card. If you remember back when I was telling you my story, I actually would utilize the balance transfers very frequently. I would get those in the mail and if it was a free balance transfer, sometimes balance transfers do have fees. If it was a free balance transfer, I would go ahead and take the check from this credit card to pay that credit card that was due that I didn't have money. I didn't have the money to pay that card. Now I'm not recommending this. This is not like, hey, let's solve your problems doing balance transfers for your funds. I'm telling you that's the state that I was in was I was robbing from Peter to pay Paul in order to stay ahead of my bills. Balance transfers can be good if you're transferring from, maybe you had had that um, high card that had the high rate and now you qualify for a card that has a lower rate, or maybe you were at that, that card where you had that annual fee and you'd like to do away with that card because now you qualify for the card that has no fee. So balance transfers can be good. Just don't get in over your head to where you are using one check from one credit card to pay the other. It is, um, rips apart, rips you apart. And, and definitely before you do any type of balance transfer, read the small writing, make sure there's no fee attached to it. Um, protection, most cards offer protection. This is why if, let me ask you this question real quick. How many of you, if you had the choice, use, which one would you use, a debit card or a credit card when you're making purchases, especially online? Which would be the safer bet, the debit card or the credit card? Debit, okay. Tara, um, you think the debit card and what's your thought process? Is it just because it's more limited? Anyone else have any guesses? More limited, okay. Debit cards also, okay. All right. And I, I get your thought process with the debit card. I really do because, well, they can only spend so much with that card. Um, I actually would recommend use your credit card. I would use one credit card for all purchases that you're gonna do online. That way you can monitor that credit card. You don't have to worry that, um, somebody's gonna charge something to it and it's gonna go unnoticed. Um, if you use that card and it gets stolen, the identity gets stolen online. If you use a credit card and you call, they will safeguard you on that. They will protect you from having to pay those fees. They may actually forgive the charge. If you use your debit card, now they have actually gotten into your bank account. And you may even have something on your credit card or your debit card that if you spend more than um, you have on your account, it automatically will transfer money into that account so you don't have a fee. And if you do, you're now um, possibly, and you'd want to know what kind of how, if you have that safeguard, that safeguard could actually open up more of your money being lost 
and not have as many protections. With the credit card, like I said, I advise one credit card that you use online, no other cards. That way you don't think, oh gosh, which card did I use in this situation? Um, quick story, I have a Verizon card that I use for online purchases and I received a text and they wanted to know if I had made this purchase. I had not. So I text back and my phone immediately rang and their loss prevention was on the phone and said, you did not make these. No, I did not. Okay. They had my card, um, that card canceled, transferred my history over to a new card and I had a brand new card number within 20 minutes. So I, the charges that were put on there, there were four separate charges. They started off with two very small ones and then they got bigger when they saw that it went through. I was not responsible for those charges. I like that. I had a client who had a Discover card. Now this one's a little different. This is why I wanna share this one. They had a Discover card and the way the Discover worked is she had attached it to a Google account for reoccurring charges. So with Discover, they have a safety on there so that you read If you change cards or eliminate your card, um, you won't have a, a, a possibility of that reoccurring charge not going through and you getting a late payment or not getting your product. So when her card got hacked, um, because it was a reoccurring card on Google, they couldn't, Discover couldn't actually cancel the card number. So what they do is if she sees those charges pop up, they immediately take them off. No problem to her. She has a different card number now, and that card number is inactive, but still it's deactivated is what they call it, but um, not get, she does not get any bills for it because they just automatically wipe those, those charges off of there. So I thought that was interesting because I've never heard of that. Um, so they've narrowed the parameters so it can only be used, you know, for purchases less than, I think it was $5 is what she's told me. So they've, they've really narrowed things down so it can't be used as often or get hacked as easily, but um, she still checks it every month just to make sure. And um, on our next slide, we're actually going to talk a little bit more about that client because that raises a really good question. Why didn't she just cancel the card? So um, instant interest rates, the interest rates on your card, always know what your interest rates are, but never, 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 never carry a balance. As long as you pay your balance off at the end of every month with your statement, you don't actually get charged that interest rate. When you see what your interest rates are, normal cards are gonna be anywhere, like I said earlier, between 19 and 23%. So if you can see how quickly that compounded interest can pile up and actually just destroy you. What is the difference? I get asked this a lot by clients. What's the difference between my statement balance and my current balance? Statement balance is when they generated the bill. This is how much you had spent on your card. And that's what's due. As long as you pay that amount every month, you stay ahead of not paying any interest payments. Um, but if you go online, a lot of times it will show you this is your statement balance and this is your current balance. Current balance is just that. That means as of today, this is how much you have spent. So those numbers can be different. If you, you, if you have used your credit card since your last statement date and your bill was generated, your current balance can be more. Um, do I have to pay off the current balance to stay ahead of the interest? No. As long as you pay the statement balance, you will not pay interest on that credit card. If you want to be ahead of it even further and pay the current balance, of course you can do that. Okay. And this screen is huge because this is that component of understanding how your credit score and how you can get the biggest bang on your credit score from your credit card. Remember I was telling you earlier, it's really important to understand what is my um, um, credit limit. Each credit card that you have will tell you, you're allowed to put this much credit on this card. You should go through and see and add all those cards up because of that amount, if you keep your spending to amount owed less than or at 30%, you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. You're going to get the biggest boost on your credit score. So example, if you add up all your cards and your credit um, limit comes to $10,000, 
multiply that by 30%, you would know that you want to keep your credit spending to about 3,000% or $3,000, excuse me, so that you get the best, best bet for the credit score. Um, these, let's see, payment history, that's 35%. That's if, as long as you pay your card on time. Again, no one wants to have a late payment, but you can see if it's 35% of your payment history is, is important enough for your credit score, that's where that can definitely weigh you down. Um, length of credit card history. Now, remember I told you my client who had that Discover card, you asked, why didn't she just cancel this card and be done with it? Well, when she talked to Discover, they encouraged her not to cancel. And the reason being, she this was her very first card that she had opened. So she'd had a credit history with this card for years and years and years. By disenrolling the card or deactivating the card, but keeping her a credit card with them, she gets to keep all that past history. So it's huge when they're looking at credit card history. Now, what she's doing now is actually she has another credit card that's close to as old as that one, but it's not quite as many years old. So as that one gets older, eventually she probably will cancel that other card out. But in order to keep her credit history strong, she did not want to cancel that card at this point in time. Um, credit mix is 10% and new credit is 10%. So it's not bad to use your credit card as long as you look at all the elements and do it responsibly. Now that brings us back to, should I cancel my credit card or should I keep it? There are certain instances that yes, cancel the card, take the hit because it's gonna save you in the end. Um, if you're going through a divorce, you may have to cancel that credit card in order to separate everything and start building your own credit score. Um, if you're part of a debt workout arrangement, they may require you to cancel that credit card. You may not have an option there. If you have a card with an annual fee and now you wanna to switch to a card that doesn't have an annual fee or maybe that annual fee benefited you at one point in time, but now in your life, in, in the chapter of life you're in now, maybe it doesn't, then it, it might be a great idea to cancel that card. Um, if you're a victim of fraud, you're definitely going to want to cancel that card. Um, but like I said, with, with the Verizon card, my card was, was canceled, but my history was transferred to the new card. So there might be options there. It just depends. And that would definitely be something to talk to the credit card company about, depending on what nth of fraud, if it's everything or just that one card, talk to them. Or, you know, some people just have too many cards and they, they want to alleviate some of that. Then I would say maybe look at your cards and figure out which is the best one for you to get rid of and maybe try and do the ones that are newer instead of the ones that are older. So I hope today helped. I hope that um, you got a better understanding of your options and how cards can work best for you. I hope that you um, learned a little bit about how to take advantage of those points and use them to give yourself more reward and um, how the credit score actually kind of all works into that factor. We actually have a free gift for you and you can scan the UR code or um, there is actually a link in the chat. Yep, the link just popped in the chat. You can go there and get the free gift. And what the free gift is, is remember how I told you you need to put um, weigh those cards out and see which card works the best for you. List the cards, list the different categories, and then put the percentages in there for which card gives you the best benefit for gas and put each card down. Um, which one gives you the best for dining out or restaurants? Put those percentages out. For groceries, put those percentages out and then weigh and see which card works the best for you and makes the most sense that you can get a cash back. Cash back on your cards. I will, I will share this as one last story um, just to tell you how powerful it can be. Um, my husband and I had, I had one of those cards where we got cash back and we actually went in and got our cash back, went through the store, did our stock up shop and spent over $300 
and still left the store with cash in hand. And all of that was just cash back from purchases that we had before. So um, again, did everyone get a chance to get that, that code? I hope so. Does anyone have any questions? I'd like to, let me get to my questions here. There we go. Okay, if you're trying to grow your credit score, is it better to pay the total amount on your credit card each month or just pay the minimum amount on the credit card? No, always pay off the credit card. Pay the credit card off because then you're not compounding interest. Keeping the credit card and using it is still gonna build your credit history because they're seeing that you're paying your card on time and you are utilizing the card, but you're paying it off so you're not getting charged. Um, especially when you look at, like, if you get a cash back, if you get 5% back on a purchase, but you're, if you carry the balance, you're going to get charged 19% interest. We want to keep a zero balance on the credit card. That's a great question, though. Um, QR code worked perfectly. Fantastic. Any other questions? Any tips on how to use a credit card to go your credit faster? I feel like I don't want to open a bunch of cards. Yeah, I would I would definitely, Brandy, you are 100% right. I would not open a ton of cards. I would look at what you have now, use our free gift, evaluate which one works best for you, and then use that. I'll be honest, I pay everything every month with a credit card. And then I pay it off every month. So I never carry a balance on a credit card. I never pay interest. But like I told you, with that stock up shop, I actually then went and got all of my stock up items, my paper towels, my tissues, my toilet paper, all those things, laundry detergent that we all have to have and they cost so much. Um, I basically got them for free because every purchase that I put on the credit card earns me cash back. So if you can do that and carry a zero balance, you're going to build credit, earn cash back, and um, there's really no downside. Anyone, any other questions? No? Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing time with me today. I hope this helps. Um, take care and have a golden day.